And as Psalm 108 says, God longs, desires to spend time with you. Isn't that amazing? And with me. God desires us to be in His presence. He not only desires us to be in His presence, the Word of God says He delights in us when we're in His presence. What a blessing. And we started by looking at the word our Father and the fact that our is very significant. We're in this together. We're not in this on Independence Day. We're here as a dependent day upon the Father as a family. We need each other, whether we admit it or not. And the longer we try to live solo, the more we find ourselves defeated because we need one another. Woodcraft cannot be all that it is without you. We need you. We need your love for the Lord. We need your gifts the Holy Spirit has given to you. We need your input as a congregation, your, your desires, your dreams, your, your, your direction from the Lord. We need that. And you need us. That's why it's important that we're all in some kind of small group together, whether it's a Sunday school, whether it's a Bible study, whether it's the praise team or the choir or a reunion group or whatever it is, we need to be in this group together and live life together and wrestle sometimes with the Word of God because we don't get it. We need one another. Our Father. He is a Father who desperately cares for us so much so that He sent His Son so that we can be with Him. Not just in this life, but forever. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. He's not just a father. He is a so different father than any other father we've ever known. And our wrestling with that is the wrestling of we have a tendency to compare our heavenly father with our earthly father, which could be good or not. And as wonderful and loving as our earthly fathers are, they have flaws or had flaws. So when we think about our heavenly father who's total, totally otherness, we have to be careful that we don't see him in the light of our earthly fathers. Okay? Totally simple. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I believe that's the pivotal part of this prayer. What goes before and what comes after is filtered through his kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. And when we start living with his kingdom desires in our heart and in our family and in our lives, we will begin to see a transformation that takes place. The praise team sang that song, Control. That's what we wrestle with. Giving control over to God. Well, Lord, I don't like that. I think you ought to. But when we surrender control, we'll begin to see things happen in some powerful ways in our lives. God, you don't need me, but somehow you want me. Oh, that is pivotal. God wants us. But we also looked out when we began to understand that your kingdom come on earth as it is in 
heaven, your will be done, transforms how we pray for our daily bread. Because once we get that right, our heart's desire is now aligned with his heart's desire so our daily bread might look different than it did before we prayed, your will be done in my life. So that's why it's pivotal. His kingdom, he longs to move in your life, in your marriage, in your home, in our church, so that he can move in our community because we, your home, Woodgrass, it's an embassy in enemy territory. And so when they see us, people, they see Jesus. So with that in mind, if you need to, open your Bibles to Matthew 6, verse 9. If not, maybe you've memorized the Lord's Prayer. Let's stand and join together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please be seated. So we have this wonderful gift of prayer. And if we surrender, we will begin to see God work in wonderful ways in our lives. But as I was thinking, what we have memorized for most of us, I guess it depends on your denomination, Methodists say trespasses, Lutherans say debts. Um, nobody likes sins, so we don't say sins. Um, but one of the things I've noticed in people's lives, and some of you who are there understand this, when you are debt free, it is like, wow, that burden is lifted from your life. Whether it's a house, it's like, wow, I've been paying on this house forever, and now, I'm debt free. And there's just this release. Uh, for, for Shannon and I, we, we really struggled. I was in graduate school. She was in undergraduate school going to SMU. And when we got out of school, we had like way, way, way too much college debt. And when we paid that off, it was like, I got a raise. It was just a release when that happened. And some of us, are carrying the weight of debt. And I'm not talking about financial debt. I'm talking about the debt of sin and guilt in our lives. And it gets heavy. It weighs us down. Remember with me the story of David and Bathsheba. I don't think David woke up one day and said, hmm, I'm going to commit murder. Sounds a good day to kill somebody. What did he do? You read the scriptures. It was a process. He woke up one day. He should have been off to war with his men. That's what kings did, but he stayed home. While he was home, he was looking out across the, the way and saw a beautiful woman, uh, Bathsheba, and what I tell men all the time, God doesn't uh, care if you look once, it's the second time that you've got to be careful. Because then you can be getting into lust, and that's what David did. 
But then David, what, not only did he look, he looked a second time, but then David inquired about her, found out, oh, she's married. He should have stopped right then. He didn't stop right then. He then invited her to dinner, and one thing led to another, and she got pregnant, and now what am I going to do? He tried to fix it, and it didn't work. So he killed her husband. The weight of that sin on David's life. The debt that he was carrying. There are two passages in the Psalms that talk about David's forgiveness process. One is Psalm 32, the other is Psalm 51. I'd like you to open your Bibles to Psalm 32. Let's look at what David does. Psalm 32. Blessed is he whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord does not count against him, and in whose spirit is no de deceit. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For night and day your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. We kind of know that, right? Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let everyone who is godly pray to you while you may be found. Surely when the mighty waters rise, they will not reach him. You are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble and surround me with songs of deliverance. Then I will, instruct, uh, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you and watch over you. Do not be like the horse or the mule, which have no understanding, but must be controlled by bit and bridle, or they will not come to you. Growing up, we lived near Freeport, uh, our Surfside Beach. Um, and one of the fun things is in the summer, uh, they would have horseback riding. You could rent a horse, and I'm thinking it was around $10 for an hour, uh, and you could ride the horse on the beach. We quickly learned something, though. Once you turn that horse around, you ain't going to stop it it would start running as fast as it could to get back to where there was water and food. But when you were going away early on, it was fine. It knew this direction, there's no water or food. It is fine. Many of us are like that horse. We're walking away. We're not realizing God desires us to run to him as fast as we can but we're like a mule. There's actually another word for that, but I won't use it. It takes a bit and a bridle to pull us back to the presence of God. The reason that David is using this in this psalm is he says, I was that mule, and the weight of the sin was heavy. I couldn't carry it. It was so heavy, I was sick with guilt, with the pain of what I'd done. And it was weighing me down. But then, I confess to the Lord, and the Lord not only forgave my sin, He removed the guilt as well. 
and some of us know that struggle with the guilt. Because sometimes we've come to the Lord and we've confessed, we've laid it on the altar, we've given it to, to Him, we've, we've pleaded the blood of Jesus, we know that Jesus has taken that away, but we continue with the guilt, the what ifs, if only I hadn't, and it weighs on us. But He wants us to surrender the guilt as well. Now, as we back up just a moment, I, I think I need to point something out. Uh, God uh, wants us to ask for forgiveness, not just to say we're sorry. I don't know if you've ever played the game sorry. We, we played it. My kids like it. Um, I think we used to even have a car version that you could play. Uh, when you're traveling, um, but this is the old uh, subtitle, The Game of Sweet Revenge. In this commercial, Ben Stein says it's the uh, game of forgive, and the kids say, no, it's revenge, right? Let me give an illustration. Nick. I'm sorry I hit your truck in the parking lot this morning. Now, there is no, doesn't have to be, any response from Nick. Now, if I said, Robbie, I'm sorry I knocked the window out of your truck this morning. Please forgive me. It demands a response. He'll either say yes, but I need your insurance. Or he'll say, no, I, I will not forgive you. To ask for forgiveness demands a response. And it's the same with us and God. To ask for forgiveness is to demand a response. His response is you are forgiven through the blood of Jesus Christ. You owed a debt, but the debt was paid. For you through Jesus Christ. I'm gonna move on Always to some of these. But many of us oh, remember to first are like this. But maybe I'm the only one. Lord, it's me. Can you do me a favor and close your eyes while I deal with a slight problem? So in otherwise, if we're not careful, we're not asking for the Lord's forgiveness, we're just saying we're sorry he's upset with us. And can I confess to you, I've done that a lot with Shannon. I'm just sorry you're ticked off. I'm not sorry that I offended. I'm not sorry I did something wrong. I'm just sorry you're upset. So there really was no confession in that, right? But when you say, forgive me for what I have done, that person either forgives, chooses, or not. Okay, with our Heavenly Father, He has already shown us that He's chosen to forgive us. We see that through the blood of the Lamb that cleanses us of our sin. Now, there's a, another part to this that we need to understand you got your Bibles back open to Matthew 6. The second part is a lot harder than the first part. Verse 12, forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. There is that two-letter word, as, conditional. Can we take that out, Lord? I just kind of don't like that part. Right? And in case we didn't get it, Jesus says this in verse 14, For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you don't forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. 
wow, Jesus. I kind of wrestle with that. Most people look at it as um, one of two ways. And possibly for us, you have to examine your heart and see which one it is. If you have someone, and I want the money that I say someone, you can think of someone, right? Fill in the blank that you are not willing to forgive. One or two things are happening. Either you don't fully know the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. Because how dare we know the forgiveness of Jesus Christ and what he's given to us and the price that was paid, the debt that has been taken on our behalf and not forgive someone else. So maybe we don't know Jesus and we're just going through the motions and we've never fully been converted and saved. Begs the question. I don't know your heart. I can't answer that for you. But it's either that or we're purposely living in sin against the Word of God. And if that's the case, then we wonder why we don't have joy in our life. We wonder why we can't love our neighbor. We wonder why we can't get about the kingdom of God in our family and our lives. It's because we have unconfessed sin against someone who has sinned against us. And we're carrying the debt. We're still carrying it. And it gets heavy. And in case we don't understand it, Jesus tells the disciples later on in Matthew 18, you don't have to turn there, but I'll refresh us in the story. Peter says, how many times shall I send my bro- uh, forgive my brother? Seven times? That sounds good. It's kind of biblical. And Jesus says, No. Seventy times seven. But, but does that mean I got to do math? Well, well, Jesus, by the time I get up to 328, I'll forget. That's the point. It's not a math question. It's a heart question. that we give them to the Lord instead of us carrying the debt ourselves. Now, how do we know if we've forgiven someone? I think a good tell is when you see them at Walmart. What do you do? Is there something that goes on in your heart or or do you turn around and go to another aisle because you don't want to see them? How about this one? I I know if I have forgiven them if I realize that I have let go of the punishment that I think they deserve. Whatever that might be. How do we know we let go of the punishment? Well, let's say something bad happens to them. What do we do? All right, they got what they deserve. All right, Lord, thank you. Or does it hurt our heart to see them go through a struggle? I remember one day I was coming down 105, coming from Houston here. You know that road. It's windy. There's very few places to pass. Uh, There was this guy coming down, going in and out of traffic, not only passing in no passing zones, he was going on the shoulder and passing people on the shoulder and going in and out. And you know what? A policeman got him, and I was like, woo Right? It's kind of that woohoo! 
I'm glad they got their comeuppance. If we're still celebrating when something bad happens to them, maybe there's some unforgiveness. How else might we know? I think we might know um, if every time we're with someone else, we bring up the hurt that they did to us. And, we, and if that keeps, you know, not, not to them, it's all usually to someone else, you know, someone we love or someone we trust, but we keep talking about them and the hurt, and I can't believe, and wouldn't you, then I think there is unforgiveness. Now, let me just say something. Unforgiveness does not mean we put ourselves back into the same level of trust with that person to be hurt again. It does not. You can forgive someone and not be best friends with them again. Does that make sense? You don't have to put yourself back to be hurt, but you've let go of their hold on your life when you forgive them. I read this illustration, and and the illustration uh, said to use uh, potatoes. Well, I didn't have any. I went to five stores to get some old rotten potatoes, and they throw them out too fast. But I have an orange tree, and we have a lot of oranges. And so the illustration is slightly different. But they say unforgiveness is like this bag of rotten oranges or potatoes that after a while gets very heavy, and guess what? Very stinky. So we're carrying this bag around, and we go everywhere we go, we've got to carry this bag. And so um, I want to have coffee. Okay, can we have coffee? Now, I'm going to bring this bag, and we're going to talk. But everywhere we go, it kind of starts smelling. And, and usually if we have unforgiveness, we have more unforgiveness, and so we continue to fill this bag up that's heavy and, and stinky. And so then uh, we go uh, out to dinner with the family uh, just because, you know, it's a good restaurant. We got this steak and you know, wonderful, but we, we got to put our right in the middle of the table because we carry it with us. We, we, we no longer have joy. Um, we, we, everything we look at is through the filter, it's, it's weighs on us, this debt, this, this thing we're carrying, this, this stinky, moldy unforgiveness in our lives. And so everywhere we, and that's just smell. Last week we smelled the sweet, bitter, I mean, the sweet fragrance of bread, right? For those who were here, <laughs> it was good. I ate some this week because we smell either sweet to someone are bitter. We carry it with us wherever we go. But what does Christ want us to do? This is a debt. This is a weight. This is the weight of me not forgiving someone for wronging me. I'm carrying it. It's the same as the debt, the weight of sin. This is the sin of unforgiveness. So the Lord says, bring it. Bring them. Put it on the altar. Don't carry it. You don't have to. He's got it. He is the judge. He ultimately will take care of whatever's going on. He will either bring them to a place of repentance where they accept Christ. If they're not a believer, then they will plead the blood and the blood will wash them or he will deal with it. That's what Paul talks about. He is the judge. Let him judge. What are we to do? Do good to them. 
<gasps> now you're saying I no longer have, not only do I have to forgive them, now I got to do good to them? That's what the scriptures say. If someone's wounded us, we forgive them. You know what else we need to do? We need to pray for them. Jesus said, pray for your enemies and do good to them. I've told you all before, I, I, for my intercessory prayer life, I have three lists. I have the sick. I have the lost. If you don't have a prayer list for the lost, you need one. People who don't know Jesus. And I have a hit list. Those are the people who have ticked me off. Don't ask me if you're on it. But what I've found out is the people that are on that hit list aren't there very long. Because when I pray for them, God begins to do something in me. He may never change them but he changes me, and he changes the way I look at them. He changes the way that now I can love them when I can't do it. It's Christ's love in me that enables me to love them. I don't have that power. What do I want? Sweet revenge, and they should get their comeuppance. That's what I want. But Christ begins to transform my life. Some of y'all have asked, and I may have shared this before, but um, I have a crucifix in my office, and someone said, well, we're not Catholic. Well, that's okay. Uh, first of all, I got this in Israel the first time I went, and uh, uh, second of all, the reason I keep this where a place I can see it daily in my office is because I remember the words of Jesus. Father, forgive them. They know not what they've done. And Jesus prayed that while they were nailing him to the cross. Father, forgive them. They know not what they've done. They don't know how much they've hurt me. They don't know what their actions did. They don't know how I am wounded because of them. But forgive them. And Father, when I can't, may you do it through me. Now, one of the things that C.S. Lewis said, and I will end with this, is that sometimes we may literally have to forgive someone a thousand times. What does he mean? He means you forgive them as an act of the will because forgiveness is an act of the will, not the emotion. And that's where we miss it. Forgiveness is an act of the will. I choose to forgive because I command it in the Word of God to forgive. But our feelings hadn't caught up. So we see them at Walmart, or we see them at Kroger's. Through the blood of Jesus, I choose to forgive them, Lord. But you still have the, some of this wrestle with some of the feeling. But you know, the more you act in the will, eventually the feelings catch up. That's what he meant. So you choose to forgive, but then, before long, you feel forgiveness towards them because the feelings catch up with the will. That's what C.S. Lewis meant. Uh, and so sometimes it's a process. I choose to forgive. I choose to let go of the debt they owe me as you have taken my debt and I forgive. I don't know about you, but I want to be debt free. That's my desire. So that means surrender to the Lord, not only our own sin, but also it means letting go 
of unforgiveness and bitterness that we may have against another person. Both of them are debts. And both of them get heavy. So as the praise team comes up, perhaps you need to write someone's name on a piece of paper and put it up here as a symbol of releasing that debt that they owe against you. I won't read them, but I will burn them if you lay someone's name up here. Perhaps you need to come and, and say, Lord, I have been carrying this guilt in my life for something that I did either this week or 20 years ago. And I need to release that guilt to you. I want to invite you to come. Lay it down because it gets heavy and it gets stinky when we carry it in our lives. Come, lay it down to him.